This is John for Global Traveler. Today I'm talking travel with Avita Robinson, writer, speaker, and founder of Nomadness Travel Tribe. How are you this morning? I'm good. I'm good. Just getting back in the States from South Africa. So navigating the jet lag, but also, you know, getting into the holiday spirit. <laughs> well, may I ask, what were you doing in South Africa? Um, I was just with friends. I tend to go to South Africa at least once a year. I really like going in December every year. Uh, I like getting out of the Northeast and going from winter into summer. I also have a lot of friends who throw events and are DJs and things like that there. So it's a it's a really cool time to be in South Africa. So I try to go every December. Oh, it sounds perfect. Could you tell everybody, give everybody a little bit of your background? Yeah. So um, I'm the founder of No Madness Travel Tribe and our annual event, No Madness Fest. Uh, I started No Madness Travel Tribe in September of 2011. So we're about 12 years old now, uh, about to be a teenager. <laughs> and um, what it started from was I'm a three-time expat. So I had lived abroad in uh, Paris, France, Chiang Mai, Thailand, and Niigata, Japan in my early 20s and really saw a gap in social media and just, you know, main media about representing different travelers of color. And being the only person in my family that really navigated the world and traveled to this capacity, I really was looking for a home online with people that understood the uh, the importance, the influence that travel can have on your life. And it ended up, you know, sending me on a trajectory in which I have built a community. We started with 100 people back in September 2011, and now we're over 34,000 members all around the world, which is great. And our brand does everything from our annual BIPOC Travel Festival, which is really like the first and one of the more well-noted in the country that brings different Black, Indigenous, Latino, Asian travelers and influencers and community leaders together to have really, you know, pointed conversations about what travel is like for us. Um, and we've been able to have some amazing sponsors come on to that annual event as well. We just executed our fourth one in Louisville, Kentucky about three months ago. It was the end of September, early October. And so it's um it's been amazing. We also do group trips. We're known for our group trips. We do regional events in which we look at and work with different tourism boards and kind of see what markets are important to them. And we pair it with the markets where we have a large membership. And so we will do feeder city events in which we'll be able to bring out our community so that they have their eyes and ears and attention um, full on to be able to talk and market their, their destinations. And we're starting to do that with brands now as well. So um, there's a bunch of different kind of entities. I too am also a media host. Um, I love going into destinations, both domestically and abroad and focusing directly on communities of color um, and pulling out those stories. Because I always found that with tourism marketing, you know, it's the landmarks and it's the generic things. But with my community, we're really looking for the stories and the people who are like the history makers today that mm -hmm. really resonate when we go to a destination and decide to put our dollars into it. Well, I, I want to get back to uh, Nomandus Travel Tribe in a bit, but first I want to ask, what led you to travel? What sparked your interest in travel? Yeah, so for me, um, I think being a three-time expat, like I graduated college in uh, 2006, and six weeks after I graduated college, I was living in Paris and with the New York Film Academy. My background is in television and video production, so there's always been a media component to the work that I do. There always will be. And... Um, with that, I wanted to pair it with a film, a filmmaking uh, certification. And so I did it through NYFA, but I live in New York. So I was like, I don't want to do it in New York. I want to do it somewhere else. And my best friend from high school was finishing up a year of working and studying abroad in Paris. And she was like, look, I have this small flat. If you don't mind sharing a bed and like everything else, you can come stay with me in Paris. And so I did right after school and it just changed my world. It changed everything. Like what, what was so cool about being with NYFA is that there were about 200 of us in the whole program. And one part of it was the actors program. And then the other part of it were various types of filmmaking, 35 millimeter digital, depending on what you signed up for. And what was cool about their setup is that if you were a director, writer, producer, you had this like crop of actors and actresses that were there on the other side of the program that you would utilize because we had to do films every week. Wow, wow. So it was a really intense program for like half a summer. And um, 
what it is, is all those people were from all over the place. So here I am fresh out of college, trying to figure out what my next steps are. And I'm, I'm thrown into Paris, France with 200 people from all around the world, Pakistan, Milan, London, like literally these people came from everywhere. And so to be exposed to that level of culture and that level of, you know, opinion and life experiences at such a young and also like very raw time coming out of college is scary. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, you're just, you're, you're raw. You don't know what's happening. It's like now all of a sudden everybody's talking to you about this quote unquote real world. And it's just like, what the hell am I doing? Like, you know, and so to be that vulnerable at that stage in my life and to be exposed to all of these different cultures and people and art to be so saturated in the art and creativity at the same time, I think was really like a blessing to my life because it charted so many things that came after it that I wasn't even aware of in that moment in time. And so it was, I, I, I give a lot of it, a lot of the testament originally to Paris and New York Film Academy and what it exposed me to. And then ultimately me ending up backpacking and living in Chiang Mai, Thailand. And then I spent a whole year in Japan um, teaching English and bartending on the weekends, which was a very interesting juxtaposition. <laughs> like, well, it, you know, it's, it's, I'm glad you brought that up because when I was reading your bio, well, one of the things I really liked was you admitted that when you were in Japan, you had a lot of anxiety, but you conquered that anxiety like day by day, week by week. Can you talk a little bit about how you did that and how you- Yeah, you and so- for me, anxiety is something that I speak very openly about, including now. I mean, it's something that I've learned to live with, but it's something that at times can be omnipresent, especially in the world we live in today. And so I talk openly about therapy. I talk openly about um, even alternative medicines. Like back then, my therapist had recommended a homeopath and I was doing homeopath remedies. But I think the biggest thing for me was, again, because you're you're raw. At that moment, at that age, at that moment in time. And that's where a lot of like psychoses kind of develop for folks. They say you start to like see those things in college and right after college. And so anxiety is also something that was hereditary, you know, when I really dug into it. But I think like working with programs like the Midwest Center for Society for um, Anxiety and Depression, doing therapy is huge. I'm a big journaler, I'm a writer. So I have been journaling. I have my life on paper since I was 10 in 10th grade. Wow, wow. So be able to being right, being able to follow that and chart your life and get all of those things out. Um, the physicality of travel. So exercise is something else that I do, because to me, I say anxiety is a lot of bent up energy that needs to go somewhere. Right. And so working out and making sure that that's a part of my my um my self-care, you know, and then also you're in these like countries and a number of them may be cheaper than the United States. So massages, like taking full advantage <laughs> of all of the, you know, customs and traditions that you also bring up in these countries to this day. Like I haven't lived in Japan since 2010 and still to this day, whether I say it out loud or not, I say it in my head. It's like, before I eat, I still bless my food by saying, itadakimasu. And it's just, there's just these things that, you know, that sure. as you travel, you pick up and you're just like, ooh, I kind of want to keep that as a part of my ethos now. And so that's been really cool. But I'm, I also think we're, you know, I'm a millennial. So I come from a generation that isn't scared to talk about these things. And I think we have language now that previous generations didn't have. And, you know, it's not shamed. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's a big thing too, is like, we're just in a space of resources and the, the internet has shrunk us, you know, we're far away, but we're so close with the internet. And so we realize that we got a lot more things in common than we have different. And, and, you know, that's one of the cool things that I love about being a millennial is like, we're not scared to kind of just like throw it out there <laughs> <laughs> and see, see what happens on the other side. Well, you know, I love that line about anxiety is just energy. I've always lived by that, that theory. If you could use that energy instead of using it to freak out, if you could use that energy for a positive end, and you, you certainly did that, that's like what I always try to live by. But another thing I read about you is that, and I love this line too, that you like to, you know, travelers, when they go, they always want to go and, you know, take some, something from the country, take something from where they go, the experience. You like to leave a piece of yourself. And I love that theory. Yeah, I think it's important. Um, I think especially as, you know, Americans, we tend to be concerned 
consumers <laughs> of everything. And so I just think it's, it's it's important to give back where you are. And for some people that may be quite literal, right? It may be volunteering when they travel somewhere, um, something in that way. But I actually think that there's like a more kind of like ethereal approach to it as well. Giving of myself, giving of my time, but also giving of my story, right? Yeah. Being able to sit down and not just consume landmarks in a destination, but being able to sit down with like, the local entrepreneur or the local cook or the guys that hang out and pop beers on the corner in Johannesburg, like being able to sit down and look at their humanity for a second and allow them to see your humanity for a second. To me, those are the most important pieces and how I say I leave myself. And honestly, that's what got me so deeply into doing the hosting that I do now with the tourism boards. I tell them, I'm like, listen, if you want a couple reels chopped up of your favorite restaurants and all that stuff, I'm not your girl. If you want in-depth storytelling in which we go into the life and why these people love your destination and what it represents to them and how people of color show up there, I'm like, I'm I'm going for Emmy Awards. Like, that's the type of content I want. You know, I want mm -hmm. people to cry a little bit, laugh a little bit and leave educated about a community that they may not have never stepped into if they didn't see me do it. You know, those are the types of conversations that I really want to have. And to me, it's what we produce, the love, the care, the skill that goes into the productions. Those are the gifts that keep on giving that are now in the world forever that help amplify these people's stories. And so I think it's, it can be the physicality and the literal well, you know, I'm going to volunteer here, but a lot of times people just want to be seen and they want to be heard. And you can also do that for free, no matter where you go. And so that, that's a big impetus and kind of like the soul behind the type of content that I create when I go to these, these destinations. Well, that's primarily one of the main reasons that drew me to you. Um, getting back to Nomadness Travel, and I love the name. That's such a, that's a such Thank a Thank you. Name. Um, I read that, and tell me if this is true, 80% of your um, participants are female? Yeah, it's Black women primarily. That and so we have 76, yeah, 76% 76 are, are Black women, and about 83% of our membership overall are either uh, millennial or Gen X. And so we have like age demographics that go across the board, but you will definitely see that there is a predominance in our event attendees, our online community of 34,000. It's very clear <laughs> the community that I, I serve. And I also tell people, I'm like, if you want a prototype for a generic nomadness member, I'm her. And so, you know, it, it's all of those attributes. And I think that that's really important to say, because I'm not making myself or my team, we're not making decisions Frivolously, you know, we are as much a part of this community as the people that help run it. So then, uh, this might be a dumb question. Um, you cater primarily to African-Americans. Are Is it open to all races? Yeah, no, like, it's a valuable a way, question. Could a Caucasian guy like me be part of it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the the analogy that I give, I just said this in our Los Angeles episode that came out, is that we're kind of like a travel HBCU, like the historically black colleges. Anybody can apply. You just know what you're applying to. <laughs> like, <laughs> so yeah, we have members from all across the board that are a part of Nomadness, including those that come on trips with us. So it's not like they're just in the fray hidden. It's like, no, 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 no. Like, you know, we're comfortable and we're desired. They'll come in and they'll jump in on a trip and they'll know that the trip is catered towards the, you know, the Black experience in conjunction with wherever we are. Like I'm thinking of one of our members that has gone with us. One of them went to Amsterdam. Another one went to uh, Colombia with us. And our entire itinerary was back based around the history of like the Afro-Colombian experience in various areas around Cartagena. And so I think there's a sense of... Um, desire to really understand the demographic that has to happen if you are non-Black within, you know, our our ethos. And I think as long as that respect is there and as long as there's a, a knowing of what you're walking into and an acceptance of that, like, you're fine. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, I think it's good to get out there because when, it, when I was talking to people about um, interviewing you, that was one of the main questions I kept asking. And I said, I don't know. I think so, but I will ask. And it was a perfect answer. Yeah, definitely. And I always tell people, 
people just ask. I'm like hyper approachable. I think people put me in a certain level when they see what I've done and, you know, who I'm around and all of this stuff. But, it, you know, you know, if you're ever in a one to one situation with me, I'm one of the more approachable people that that you'll meet. And so it's always I'm always down to answer the question. Well, you certainly you certainly were uh, very approachable when I, I approached you for the interview. You were very gracious in giving me your time, especially since you just come back from South Africa. So I appreciate that. Before we before I let you go, tell everybody whatever you'd like to say about uh, No Man's Travel Tribe. What, uh, tell everybody where they can find out more information. Yeah, absolutely. So depending on, you know, everybody's role in, you know, travel, if you're a leisure traveler and you're interested in more information on what we do and our events, particularly our festival, uh, it tends to happen in like the September, October-ish time every year. Uh, we haven't announced it publicly yet and I can't hear, but uh, we do know where our festival for 2024 is going to be. So stay tuned for that information. I would say you can find it at nomadnessfest.com. You can also follow us, nomadnesstraveltribe.com. And if you're savvy and on social, at Nomadness Tribe across the board on everything. Uh, if you're more interested in seeing the content that I do and myself in the space of host in these different destinations around the world, you can also follow me, um, evitarobinson.com. And on social media, I'm at evirobbie. E V I E R O B B I E. Um, and it's all on there. My social imprint at this part is at this point is like a big like media resume. Um, because I just love this work and quite frankly, I want more of it. So if you work in the industry and you have a destination that you feel needs a bit more representation, um, and you want to tell these types of stories and do it with somebody who can do it with care and with levity and a little bit of humor, um, please feel free to reach out because I I absolutely love the work that I do. And one last quick question. What would your travel tip be? You've traveled all over the world. You've got a lot of experience, a lot yeah. of cultures. Talk to strangers. Talk to strangers. Don't be so in your resort and <laughs> to the group that you came with or solo. Um, there's something really beautiful to just listening to the stories and having that exchange. And so I would say, you know, we're safe talk to strangers. Well, Vita, thank you so much for your time. I, I really appreciate it. I love your passion. I love your enthusiasm. You. Um, I When uh, when you have the, the dates announced, let us know. You know we'd, be glad Absolutely. To, we'd be glad to bring you on for an update next year. Yes, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now you get some rest. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>